CNN Alert. A suspected terror attack is underway in Nairobi. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Officials say armed criminals are still inside. Welcome to the Sons of Liberty podcast, coming to you from the Liberty Tree Studio in San Antonio, Texas, where we discuss topics of the day, firearms, great food, and even better whiskey. Grab a drink, sit down with your host, the Founding Daddies, Mike Mahalski and Kyle Grothus. All right, guys. This is Mike with the Sons of Liberty podcast, and uh, today we're going to sit down and have a conversation that I've been waiting to have for a long time with uh, Christian Craighead. Um, if you remember, Christian Craighead is the gentleman that went into the hotel. Yeah, DC, uh, DC D2 Hotel Complex, 14 Riverside Drive. And this gentleman went in by himself, and uh, I think everybody in our space that uh, probably knows who you are. <laughs> you probably don't need too much of an introduction. But thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks for having me on here. It's uh, when we talk about why I'm here. Yeah. But when I say why I'm here, there's no agenda to this. This is pretty much just two buddies having a chat. There's nothing. We're not. I'm not pushing anything on this, and uh, and neither is. <laughs> so, a little technical difficulty. All right, we're good. <laughs> and and neither is uh, Sons of Liberty. It's just a it's just a chat, and it's unscripted, and it's yeah. yeah. We'll, see, we'll see what comes from it. Yeah, yeah, and that's pretty much how I like to do some of these conversations. Is I don't really have a plan or a direction or anything, but I mean, I've gotten to know you over the last couple of months, and we've had some great conversations. So I don't think it's going to be all, it's going to well, be all that difficult. As then. I found out before, my life is no plan. Sometimes the the best plan. Yeah, so. yeah, same here, same here. A little bit different directions, but yeah. <laughs> so so uh, let's uh, let's get into this, this a little bit. So you are here in the United States, and you've been in Texas quite a bit lately. Yeah, yeah. So um, I've been back and forth over the last um, few months just prepping the ground um, legally to, to work in the United States, and, and now I have a U.S. visa, uh, and I... And I work work pretty much in the uh, firearms community now. And uh, how, how long ago did you get your visa uh, approved? Uh, from now, it's just been a, a few weeks. Wow. How long did that take? Well, it it took a while. It didn't really take a while. Um, would you, the companies that were sponsoring me just had the wrong legal team, and and then I got introduced to a legal team who were on the ball. And once they once they took control of things it went really quickly and they were good i can't really mention the the name of the the company but i'm very thankful they know who they are okay. and it went it went fast but it is extremely difficult um to get a visa to the united states um i i know that i'm i mean i i struggled i've got quite an exceptional career and it was hard for me um and I, and we've i've said this to you before i think everyone is Especially, I imagine everyone who's listening to this knows we have a, a there's a border crisis in the United States. But what people don't consider or, or think about is there's a lot of people, law-abiding, tax-paying individuals who are desperate to get into the United States, and it's extremely hard for those. So there is a there is a double standard going on here, um, and um, you know <laughs> people want to pay lots of tax and. Uh, uh, there should be issue. I, you know, it's yeah. I mean, you should yeah, have just it, should have just come through El Paso, man. You'd have been you'd have been you'd been here a long time ago. <laughs> can you can you explain a little bit what the process is like? Because I mean, I'll, I don't even. What is the um, process like to apply for a visa, and what are, what does it look like? I'm not really in a good position to do this because every visa, there's so many visas to get into the United States. It's not just a. Um, yeah, um, I want to do this and here, and um, so there's different visas for different people and different qualifications. Well, maybe what, what was your path, I suppose? Um, again, it's it's I've got I've got the um, an an old visa, like an exceptional personality. Okay. Um, so yeah. Okay, can you can you discuss why it was hard? It's I mean, like it was hard. I think a lot of legal companies were either trying to, in my opinion make money out of the process to make it slower for other for companies who are willing to pay anything to get someone in and, and delaying it 
and then um, but once like I say once a particular legal legal company had control of things then the uh, they were all over all over it and they just got it done very quickly wow. um, and so for the other visas why it's so hard for other people again it's I can't really comment because everyone's everyone's different but I, I, all I do know is is it is difficult and I and and dare I say I think there's a lot of people in the in the United States earning money illegally but not really thinking they're doing anything illegal that's 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 I, I think that's quite quite common where people are in the United States making money um, and they don't think they're doing anything wrong I I from the minute I retired from the army I wanted to move into America it was all part of my plan and then the um, two weeks to um, flatten the curve uh, had something to say about that and then um so so i've always been doing everything really by the book so i didn't want to compromise and because that's what someone gave me advice early on before i retired from the military from from uh, department of state they're saying if you eventually want to become a u.s citizen do not do even though you see other people doing this thing making money you just do everything by the book because if you if you get caught that's it's all over that's the american dream over so i was always kept that in the back of my mind and, and it was frustrating and hard for me for the last few, like two or three years, like trying to work on getting this visa. And now, um, very thankfully, I've I've got the I've got a, uh, a visa and I can you know, um, work in the United States. Well, what? Why did you want to come here? Why Why did you want to leave the UK where you served in, in your yeah the motherland? <laughs> why did you want to come to the United States? So, like. For me, this is this is the land of opportunity. That it is no one's. For me, as a, for as a, for Chris Craighead as a as a product, um, there there is no interest in the United in the United Kingdom. You, you know they don't they don't they don't they don't. It's not it's not something people buy into. There, I think there will, there will be a lot. There's lots of supporters, so, and I'm thankful for, for them. But um, everything is hard to do in in UK, whether it be working. Uh, just everything's just difficult in UK it seems to be the everything is the can't do mentality where in the US it's the can do mentality so it's uh, for me it's just much easier to work and to get work and people seem to be more interested in me as a product in the United States and and, and plus uh, again all, all all that aside about the personal aspect and making money and things like that is that you know Hopefully, someday in the future, I will become a, an American citizen, a citizen. It's a long, long path. If you don't know, it's going to take me about seven years, all said and done. Oh wow! But that's that's what I want, and I don't want dual citizenship. You know, I want U.S. citizenship because, to me, um, the United States is the light, the light of the world. And for any foreigners rolling the eyes, it is, and for any liberals that. If you've somehow found the wrong channel and think you're listening to something else, then again, well, now that you're rolling your eyes um, and you haven't turned off, is the United States of America is the light of the world. If it all collapses in this country, there is no one coming. There is no aid packages getting dropped by the UN. I mean, I mean the UN. I'm not going to even talk about the UN, but there's no aid coming from the UN. There's no aid coming from Europe. There's nothing. You or we are on our own, and he, and here's the other thing: is um, some people might think it's political or international overreach, but again, if the United States of America collapsed on itself, in my opinion, then the whole world—that's it—the light goes out. The light goes out. I'm not saying there's going to be global war or anything, but it just means civilization, as we know, civilization would be fundamentally it, it, it is, different. Is, is done. It's done. It's done. It's. And that's why I think it's the light of the... And that's why everyone hates the United States of America. That's why people... Because people hate success. And the United States of America represents success. And so certainly just, the opportunity China, for China, success. China, but, you know, China's got things going on and it's growing and maybe... But people don't look in China and go, that's China, high five. Well, unless you live in California, I suppose. <laughs> can, yeah. we edit, can we edit this? Because I have just got a visa. I don't want it to take them off of me. I don't know. Um, but... Um, no, but, <laughs> no, you're you're good. We'll we'll go but, through but it. Just, um, but 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 people just like them. Like look at the American. Oh, America. Why is that? Because it's 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 like if someone's successful, if someone looks at Chris Craighead, oh Chris Craighead, 
or whoever. Uh, I think around the world, from my travels around the world, the the image of America sometimes is uh, is is arrogance and consumerism and you know um, like the unfettered capitalist. Uh, that's the, when I when I travel around the world and I, I you know and the topic of America comes up. That's it. But everybody also agrees that it is the land of freedom. It mm-hmm. is uh, the opportunity. You know, yeah. there's an opportunity there that's not really present in a lot of other places to to be able to start from from nothing and achieve something. I don't know if that's true uh, in many many places in the world. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean. I, that's what no, it's my my opinion of of America. I think it's it's vital for civil life, but I I want to be part of it. I want to come. I want to be back here because I think if and God forbid that it did get worse, anything did get worse, I'd kind of want to be in America. It'd be like like like. I I think if whatever happens, whether it be aliens, whether it be <laughs> whether it be whether it be just global calamity of some order, I think being in America for me would be a better place. It'd be like the last bastion like the Alamo or whatever, it'd be like holding out here and then once, and then like say the, the light goes out when it goes out. When you made the comment that, that in the UK that like the Chris, the Chris Craighead product, you know, that doesn't seem to be like a, a palatable uh, or marketable thing there in the UK. Why is that? I mean, our, you know, here I feel like we, we treat our, our military, you know, heroes and servicemen. And I think, you know, we, we, we hold, we hold them to a, in a place of reverence, you know, and in your story is incredibly famous here in the States, especially amongst like the gun community, the veteran community. I mean, everybody, you know, when I tell people, Hey, I'm going to go have dinner with Chris Craighead later on, like everybody's very stoked. They're very amped, you know, yeah. are you saying that that appetite or that, that interest level is not like that in the UK? It, it is. Um, and it isn't. So within the law enforcement, military or areas of the military community, it is. But in general society, it's like, uh, again, it's my opinion. And, and for those who support me or then saying that's not true, it's just my opinion. But there's but people I don't care. It's like, oh, it's, um, you know, it's, that's what they do. That's what they're paid to do. That's what people should do. Oh. I don't, that's what I think. And, but it's different. It's, it, and again, just from my experience, um, well, I had a, a, it's one day in London. This is about... I say it's about a year ago, it was probably longer. But I met with a friend of mine and uh, ha- having breakfast. And I won't name Doc, but he's a famous guy. And he's like, and uh, and he was talking to me and he said, oh, I told my, one of my best friends, his wife is very senior in the in the foreign office. And, I, and he goes, oh, and he said, oh, I'm, I'm going to meet Chris Craker tomorrow for breakfast. And his friend was in the military and he was like, oh, that's good. His wife apparently was like, Pff. like, oh, I don't like him. And I was like, what, why, why was it? And he went, well, she said he should never have done what, what he did. He could have messed everything up. Or words to that effect. And, and that's, a common, that's a common thing I've heard throughout the establishment, if you like, from high-ranking officers, from you know, more senior people of the military. I shouldn't have done that because I could have messed things up. But what are they when they say then, me, like messed what up in their yeah. mind? What what was that well, risk well, that he messed up? I tell you what's a risk is if if I didn't done what I did that day and, and it failed and it'd been a massacre, I would have been the scapegoat for that. So I didn't I didn't just put my physical life on the line. I put everything on the line, and that's I would have been the scapegoat for it all, and it would have been looked bad for UK optics in my opinion. And and that's what they don't like is he could have he could have messed everything up could have spoiled the relationship, could have done anything. But the fact I didn't, and that to me is the nature of special operations. It's a high stakes game. It's like risk all and win all and it lose, you lose big. But people didn't seem to share that in the establishment. And um, so that was that one person's view. Um, Did the Kenyan government take an, a position or an opinion on your actions? Did was there an, uh, an official opinion or anything from their government? Not seen. But I can't really talk. I'm not going to go into too much detail on, on no, that side of things. No, no, for a, sure. But I guess what I'm asking, though, is did were they grateful? Yeah, yeah. Any every interaction I had with the Kenyan government post the event was always extremely positive. And the people of Kenya, did you ever interact with? Yeah, the- yeah brilliant. Yeah, the, they st- and still continue to be really, really supportive. And um, 
So it wasn't like it wasn't like there was a diplomatic issue there. Or something. No, absolutely not. Every 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 engagement I'd had with the the Kenyan authorities post the incident has been extremely positive in every in, in every way. And and um, yeah, the, and 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 after the incident, they were all very very supportive. And the people of Kenya, who I came across and who knew who I was, and since then have all have always been. Um, very, very thankful. Um, but I, I don't want to go into too much no, detail. No, no, no. But I don't want to push. So, what did you do before you got into the military? I hadn't finished my story. Oh, I'm sorry. Go so, ahead. Oh, <laughs> so we we're talking about the, the tale of two opinions. Yeah. Well, we had the uh, the foreign office senior foreign office member had said he shouldn't have done what he did. He could have messed everything up. Words to that effect, um, allegedly. And then, um, so that was fine. You know, each, and but it's something that I'd heard a lot in the system. Um, and to add into that, one of the senior officers in the British Army or the British military, I should say, one of two, and I, um, independent witnesses have said the same thing. So, and um, so one of the senior ranking uh, members of the British Armed Forces allegedly said that Christian Craighead is a bad example to young soldiers. Because his mutineer attitude promotes lawlessness in the military, and so, you, and you can you can tell just by those words it's not it's it's kind of like an offerish offerish is word to say or term to say but like uh, yeah is a bad I'm a bad example to young soldiers because of my mutineer attitude promotes lawlessness in the military. So, so they <laughs> so is there um, is there. Um, so that was that. So that's sorry. That's me. I'm going a bit off track. No, um, no, no, no. Uh, that's exactly what I mean. I, that, that was kind of the sentiments I was wondering and, and very curious about. Uh, so there, were, there are high-ranking people in the UK military that believe that your actions were not mutinous, but like a mutinous type of position. Or I, I think, as far as the British establishment goes, that's the big problem. Is is what, and is that because what, there's such a bigger gap between like the officer class and the enlisted class? I don't, class I don't know or? if it's I don't know if it's is is black and white as that. I think it's just a, a thing in general. Is what I what I what I did that day is more than just saving people's lives. You know, I I acted outside of orders, doing what I thought was the right thing to do. And and then having a lifetime of high end experience. And some would say I wasn't. Well, some people have said I wasn't just the right man at the right place at the right time. I was the man who had to be there. My whole life had been preparing for that incident, in my opinion. And then, um, um, uh, and then I went in, did it, and was successful. And and, and um, the, the, I won't go into the detail of the incident itself, but everyone kind of knows what happened. And then, but 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 that that photograph. The icon of photograph of me going into, into it through the doorway. It rep it's not just a picture of some badass going in <laughs> to go in hunting for terrorism and rescuing people. In my opinion, and I I'm, I need to stop saying in my opinion a lot. I'm saying it a lot trying to, to protect myself. In way. I don't know if it makes any. It's a bit like that Sal Giga Knights or something. Where I say just because you say with all due respect doesn't mean you can say anything <laughs> you want. Um, but um, but that photograph it represents. It represents rebellion, if you like. That's why I think they don't like it. It represents someone who shouldn't be doing something, standing up and doing the right thing, and saving people's lives. And and I think that's part of the whole like success of the incident or success of Chris Craighead. It's the whole why people are interested in it because it's bigger. It's bigger than just doing a one man hostage hostage rescue mission. It's bigger than it's big. It's it's that act of being able to do something. When the when the times now was like who's gonna do it? It's gonna it's gonna be you. That that's what the whole thing represents, and, and I think the establishment does do not like that at all. Um, so that that that's that part. So I then have breakfast with my friend. <laughs> I'm gonna tell this story, and uh, and then I jump into a black cab in London, and I'm in the back back um, taxi at the cab, and the guy got salt over the earth, cocked me. Uh, you uh, taxi driver, he's driving and he's looking in the mirror and he's like, yeah, uh, I, I, I think I know you. And I'm like, 
oh, he goes, have you been on telly? And I goes, not, not really. And he was like, oh, he's looking. And I went, and he, and then he, I got into something else. And then we talked, and somehow it said about, we talked about the, the army. And he went, you're that geezer from uh, Kenya. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's me. And he, he goes, can I stop the cab? And he pulled in and he was like in tears. And he was going, I, I can't believe you're in my taxi. This is like one of the proudest moments of my life. You know, you're what's great about Great Britain. You know, everyone like what you did is like amazing. I'm so thankful for people like you. And then he tried, he goes, do you mind if I phone my friend? My friend always talks about you. I want to get a video <laughs> call in. So he called his friend. His friend didn't answer, but it was all that. And, 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 and I was just being quite like, yeah, no big deal. Inside, I was like breaking down. I was like thinking this is really, because I hadn't really heard any, like much, um, anything like this before. It was quite, it was, I say it was a year ago, it was longer. And then, um, but it was interesting to see the tale of like the two sides of the coin. If you've got, the establishment going, he shouldn't have done that. He could have, he could have messed things up to, you know, like the salt of the earth, the working class going, what you did is what's great about Great Britain, et cetera, et cetera. So it's interesting to see that. And, and that's when sometimes I, I might paint a negative light too much. And actually I should be, and I'm, I am very thankful, but maybe there is a lot of people in the UK who support me. I just, I just don't see it. So. Wow. I think it make, I think it's starting to make a little bit of sense because when we've talked about this in the past, I've, I've tried to understand why uh, why the establishment would have such a problem with what you do. But when you put it in the context of looking at what, at least from the way we see the UK, like you know, the, from the, what we see, right, like from the outside, from we we've heard stories that if you make a if you make an inflammatory joke on the internet, like someone can come knock at your door, like on behalf of the state. Is, yeah. It, I mean, is that true? Like, I mean, um, does the UK have those kind of, like the, that kind of speech issue? Um, I'm not too, I'm not too sure. I think they definitely, I don't want to get into this because this again could be very legally like no, no, flammable uh, no, in, no, any, no, in any particular, but, um, I but, guess, but I think it's like in general in society. Um, fuck it. I'm going to say it. Um, if I was to sh go outside and shout, kill the Jews and murder the Jews and rape the Jews, I'm sure I'd get a pat on the back for that in this day and age. Because that seems to be permitted by the state in whether it be United States, uh, UK or whatever. But if I say anything else about anyone else, then yeah, they, they could have something to say about that. Yeah, th that's, that has been a surprising trend. It's, that might be something to edit out. I don't know. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> That has been a surprising trend. I, I, I had, I, I guess, I didn't fully appreciate the the sentiment of, and I, I'm watching this all over the world when it when it comes to certain comments like that. That, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, and and just in case you haven't ad edited it out or whatever, or I made a comment before is that just so everyone understands, and I think if you follow me on social media, you will see that I, I support Israel in more than one way. But um, yeah, I'm a full support of Israel. And um, just in case anyone takes my comment earlier on out of context, I just said that's what I was calling for. Now, so. Luckily for us, I think that our our listenership, we, we have a, like these conversations that require nuance, like it, having it in the, in the, in the, in the context of a long form conversation that you can actually have that it's not a sound bite that gets clipped and then taken out of context. I mean, we're having a, a conversation. I don't think anybody is going to mistake what you said for being anti-Semitic, you know, considering the, like the, the, using it as an example. Um, but going back to the establishment side, it, it does very much feel like the UK has, the United States feels like it's going in the direction of the UK with having given the establishment that much power over content on the television, regulation of the internet, um, you know, just overall, like the, the there's a lot more narrow path. It seems that you have to walk over there, and perhaps your actions being outside of the orders, outside of order, mm -hmm. is what threatens it. Not the action itself, but the fact that yeah, uh, you didn't get the the blessing. Yeah, I think there's, there's a whole load of I think, and I, I might be overthinking it. I, I don't think I am, but it's there's the whole factors of being from a working class background to. Um, to not having orders, to not being like a golden 
you know, like when you know, we all know these types of people, the the golden balls, and they can do whatever they want. But um, I think there's a whole lot of factors that didn't make it popular with senior personalities. And I and and the other thing as well, uh, and I should um, and I, I like I want to say this is that make no doubt about it that I have had nothing but support and respect from members of the SAS, my unit, and uh, we haven't really talked about my military background yet. I don't know if we will, but um, members of the of 22nd Special Air Service Regiment um, have been nothing but supportive of me, not just my peers, but um, the old and bold, who I thought would be quite negative to, to what I've maybe done and what I'm doing now. And they've always approached me, and it always catches me off guard. They're saying, hey, what you did that day was a great example of what the regiment can do, and also what you're doing now, and you're a good example. You're, a, you know, you, you're good, what, what kids need these days. So everyone's and not one person, touch wood, has ever criticised me yet, yet, and said from your unit, yeah, for, and, all, ex, and 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 I even get now when I'm when I've been back in Hereford of young guys coming up to me and saying, yeah, you don't know me, but um, I'm in whatever squadron, and um, I, I joined the SAS because of you. Thanks, for, yeah, and all the blokes think you're great, and da 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 da. So it's and that's really nice to hear, but no one yet has come up and said you shouldn't have wrote a book that you can't publish or. You shouldn't. <laughs> you shouldn't wrote a children's book that you can publish. You shouldn't have. You shouldn't have done the Sons of Liberty podcast. No one said. <laughs> no one said anything like that yet. What What is the pipeline for that? So you you, you enlist in the army. What, how old were you when you enlisted? Uh, sixteen. So you enlisted at sixteen. Yeah. Is that, is that the age of enlistment over there? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's. Um, I've talked about it a, a couple of times, but um, in the uh, nowadays you have the Army Foundation College. And when, it, when I say the word college, um, this is in res- for respect to the young people who do it. It's more army than co- than college. It's it's you're in the army there, so it's not like some school where you do a bit of uh, dress up. It's you're in the army, and the the army foundation college prepares young people who who enlist at sixteen, seventeen, and then they do lots of courses and training, and then they go and carry on their training and into the into the regular army after I think it. It may be six months of training. Um, when I joined the army, it was different. You had um, the, ju- the the junior army had um, you had uh, junior apprenticeships, so you had you could join if you had a if you're going to be like an electrician or uh, some sort of manual trade. You would do an apprenticeship for a year. You had the junior leaders, which is everyone else in the army would have a year's training, and you would get junior rank, so you'd be like junior corporal, and would give young people leadership experience. And the and then you had junior para, which is um, the, my unit, which was the parachute regiment. And junior para was different because there you did six months of getting thrashed. And uh, and I look back at it quite fondly. It's a weird thing. Um, it's quite brutal what they did there. I was the last junior para platoon, and they had like a gap for about a year, and then they started the Army Foundation College. But it was uh, a year of getting th- sorry, six months of getting thrashed, and then you. Then you join on to normal training, but when whenever you enlisted, you knew that's what you wanted to do. Yeah, you yeah, to the yeah, yeah. And the, 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 so the for, for the listeners, if you don't know, the parachute regiment is the equivalent of like the ranger regiment here, and uh, it's like the um, the elite outside of special forces there, and and especially then it wasn't it was 1992, and they had a super like um, f- ferocious reputation, and a lot of lot of people in my circle, my family, and um, friends didn't think I'd get in. I, I knew I would, and it's all I wanted to do. But every, every, I was always quite thin and skinny, and everyone was going, he's never going to be a... Like, What's the attrition rate for that, for, for the people that attempt to start in the, the so finish? So with, um, with a, factoring my example and junior para, 60 recruits turned up on day one, and then nearly a year later, after we'd done junior para and then into the training... Of those sixty, um, I think it was about eight or nine people passed. Um, uh, the I think a standard example would be from from day one of parachute regiment training. This is like a guesstimate. Say sixty people turning up, and I think about twenty people, eighteen to twenty people would pass out. I think that's a fairly accurate example how, how certainly how it used to be i might be wrong i might be wrong but that's how i think it is but it's it's pretty it's tough in the parachute regiment is that 
So I, I'm completely unfamiliar with like the UK military structure. Yeah. I, you know, like I'm very familiar with how it is here in the in the states, but over there, <clears throat> the parachute regiment that is at that point you're considered you're, you're in the SAS. No, no, no. That's like that. You, that you're just a paratrooper. You're a paratrooper, but it's still a cut above. A, it's a cut above a, everyone. I and mean, uh, there'll be people who are ex British Army who weren't a paratrooper who'll be rolling their eyes or turning off now. <laughs> and they've probably turned off already. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, bye. <laughs> is the, uh, but they'll be like, oh yeah, but yeah, we're, it's the, 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 the and I, I sincerely hope it's still the same, but the parachute regiment, I think, were the only true warriors. It's going to be sting, it's going to sting a lot of people in the, in the British Armed Forces. Yeah, there's, there's good, and there's people going, I, I serve lots of tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, yeah, da, 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 and yeah, I know, yeah, you're all kind of warriors, but the whole culture, the real, true, like, warrior culture was definitely hammered into me in the, par in the paratroop regiment and it certainly set me up for the rest of my career this the things that i the paratroop the paratroop paratroop training paratroop training people say, yeah. hey, if you say that the parachute regiment training is definitely like puts you on a on a on a different sort of mindset and and and, and, fo and have a, a, a different focal point to other soldiers in my opinion and do you have to serve in a para, in a para regiment or paratrooper regiment for a certain amount of time before you can apply or try out for SAS? Is that how it works? Yeah, you can. So the SAS recruits from, uh, recruit and, from or, UKS, all of UK Special Forces recruits from the Army, Navy, and, and Air Force. And um, uh, the last time I checked, it was you have to do three years, three years service, clean service, and then you can apply. And then, and then people apply and. And and then I'll, I'll select it. And then, what, what, what? So you leave? You go from the parachute regiment to the SAS. Is there a separate selection there, though? There's a yeah, yeah. There's a selection thing. And I, I didn't. I went from the parachute regiment, and then I went. I still maintained my cap badge of the parachute regiment, and I went to Pathfinder Platoon, which is like a force recon um, type unit. Okay. Again, a really hard selection process. I served there for nine years, and then then I applied for uh, the SAS. I applied for the SAS before. I, I tried selection three times and, and failed twice beforehand. You kept trying. Yeah, and it was like, and they and they were they weren't like uh, they were just bad luck. Um, the two times before, but um, and then on the third time, I, uh, at the age of twenty nine, I think um, um, I passed. And what what year was that? Was this after nine eleven? Yeah, after after eight? nine eleven. Yeah. Wow. So, so. so you knew you were gonna go. You were gonna go get in a fight somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, and 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 the, the world changed, and it's in in looking even looking back in my, when I used to think how often you used to go to my hometown and things, the whole world changed, without a lot of people realizing it in two thousand one, because that's when the military changed. Even when you didn't think it did, in hindsight, when I look back after I retired, I went, yeah, everything changed after two thousand and one, and it may it may to some people it may seem obvious, but it's like the little things, the little details, and how. Um, Can you give me an example? Like, well, I think one of the one of the things I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just I don't even know what all of that <laughs> is. Uh, um, is um, in uh, like pre pre two thousand one. Yeah, there was the, there's a few uh, like things like what happened in the Balkans and uh, and then for, for the British perspective, there was the Falklands in nineteen eighty two, and then there was the ongoing conflict in Northern Ireland. But real like fighting if you like what was good very so real fighting was very very rare and it was an exclusive club that not many people had done it or you'd have to say i have to get to special forces to really get a taste of a of a, of a true firefight or a true bit of experience then 9 11 happened and then it became very inclusive to to go on operations and to, to get into fights and to see combat so the so the takeaway from that is when you're doing training Whereas pre-2001, you were training for this could happen, it's unlikely, but we're training for combat and we're training to shoot people and we're training to do that, whatever it is your job is. With it, with it, with it, but then it became real after 2001 and now it's like whatever we're training for, you're probably going to do it for real or you, there's a good chance you could do it for real. And I, I think people might, I think a lot of people might not have realized that or and maybe people right now are hearing that and look back and go, actually he's got a point. And some people are probably going, oh, he's 
talking shit. But um, so how long total was your military career? Twenty eight years. Twenty eight years. When the incident happened in Kenya, what how what year was that again? Uh, 2019. 2019. Can, can you believe that 2019 is nearly five years ago? No, I think it's just the, like if I think about this all the time, my, my my son's about to turn five, and it these last few years have gone by so fast. Yeah. yeah. So 29. Wow. So you were so a I mean, you were a senior yeah, guy at the time. 20 26 years into my career. So I mean, you were, yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah. Wow. I mean, you'd already. You had a stellar military career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. I, had a, I had an unusual career that I, um, for now, I'm not going to disclose, but I had a very, very unusual career in 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 the SAS as well. And so, it, without uh, going into detail, can you can you elaborate at all what what you what you mean? Not it's details. Just, no. It's just uh, so there's two things that aren't really that sense. One is that I was like the lead at one point in my life. I was the lead CQB instructor. So I lived and breathed hostage rescue and, and other offensive action, things like that. So I was, and I, and I was like a, I would view myself and people might roll their eyes here. Again, I shouldn't give a fuck about what people think, but I seem to do it a lot. Is, um, is that I was kind of a trailblazer in regards to hostage rescue and, 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 and shooting and, and yeah, all that kind of, which is why I'm here. Yeah. Um, uh, so there was that and, um, um, what was the other thing? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd, I'd done that. And, and because of something that I'd done before, I'd pretty much knocking on the door with over nearly a thousand missions. Um, so that's a thousand quite, real world missions that you like had. Yeah, G, yeah uh, G what missions? Um, uh, you know, I don't, I didn't, I wish I kept a diary, but I, I've done more than 500 and I've probably done a little bit less than a thousand. So it's somewhere in between, but I, that's, but that's a lot of, ex, that's a lot of experience. And, um, um, uh, and um, yeah, so 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 I, in some ways, I've been training for um, for this mission all my life. Yeah, you. And there was the childhood factor and everything, which um, one day you might hear about or read about or watch about or whoever were about. But, <laughs> but uh, so, I, I did ask you what what did you do before you got in the military? What what was? I was just a, a, ki a kid. So did you play sports? Did you play? Yeah, I played. Um, I got into rugby union. Um, it's like American football, but for hard people. <laughs> <laughs> no, there you go. There you go. Uh, I, that's a, yeah, you can, yeah, that's good. That's a T, that's a sticker. That's a, so, I, so I shot, fired the gun, it was amazing. Which, it, which staccato specifically? I think it was the XC. Mm -hmm. And and I, for some reason, thought that, yeah, that's a competition gun, which you could say it is, but, it, but you can, uh, there's a duty carry now. Um, so that was that. And then in Shot Show last year, or sorry, this year, Shot Show, I then got introduced to my friend who's now a good friend, Tony uh, Pignato. Yeah, he's a good and, guy. Uh, I just and, saw him this last week. And then, yeah, yeah, and he was like, and long story short, he was like, hey, do you want to come to Texas and just check out our guns and check out our facility? So I was like, yeah. And I was talking to guys in, in my old unit in the SES saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to go to uh, Staccato and have a look around. No intention of working with them because not, anything personal I was just like I was but I was just like going hey I'm really chuffed that they're um asking me there because I'd like kind of like to be associated with Stakao because they're such a good good company and, and such a good product so I'd, so that's all I was, was for and I said oh might give me some product for social media do some shooting so went there met some personalities did some shooting did the bits I didn't really it's probably always kind of rigged up for the start but uh, and then uh, and then I spoke to some people and they said we want you to to work with us and we're going to support your US entry visa and things and then, and then now I'm here that's amazing and uh, yeah and, and the the like and I, and again this whole thing of um you know I supported Zev Technologies uh, when I retired because that's what I knew and my pistol build when I retired was pretty much heavily Zev um, is that what the duty, or is that what your service pistol was? What was your service no, pistol in them? It was a Glock 19. Okay. But um, but I, I, I didn't know at the time that it was legal to do it, but I had, and now I realize it is, that I had it completely tricked out um, <laughs> yeah. from stuff that I'd bought myself and, yeah. and put on it. Um, and then, um, but it's amazing, you know, the, the, when you hear all the comments, you know, all the social media experts going, oh, well, I thought you said Zev was good, and now you're saying Staccato is. Who's next? And, and I'm thinking, what? You're not allowed to evolve. Is it's like saying if you buy a car, the first car you ever buy, that's you've got to use that for the rest of your life. Yeah. And let me let me give you like this isn't my take on it. So 
uh, the the comments online are very you know, you, you, they're it's a very the internet is an amazing place I think to showcase your ideas and I think it's an amazing place to showcase someone's art or craft or talent right I like mm-hmm. to show what we do you know on the internet the internet is a fucking terrible place for feedback okay the internet <laughs> is a terrible place for feedback because first of all I mean you're you're it, it gives quite unqualified people you know quite a microphone to, yeah. to comment on things that you know there I those aren't the opinions that I seek whenever I'm trying to necessarily like you know uh, get meaningful feedback on something that's not yeah. it's strange uh, isn't it how you never get any troll comments from like pro shooters or or yeah that's or very rarely anyway I don't the, the, but, but the, it's but it's it's very rare that you get people who actually know what they're doing commenting going yeah you shouldn't be doing that or that's BS yeah the kind of people whose feedback I give a shit about aren't aren't surfing Instagram looking for for places to go take a shit yeah you know and, yeah. and so that's why I mean I'll tell you right now here's some good advice post and ghost unless you have a I mean, I know you like to interact with a lot of the people that follow you, and, and, if, and if there's and if there's like a meaningful conversation to have, but as far as the troll stuff, man, that doesn't influence a damn thing for how we. D- I don't take my cues for our business development, our product development from from shitty posts online. Yeah, I know? think I think that's pretty evident to what I've said up to this point. Is that I do think too much about what people think, but, and uh, and I and I'm still trying to learn that. It's like oh, and I'm like oh yeah, I think. And but but, tell, uh, but it totally makes sense though. I remember my own evolution in this kind of thing. Like as, as as your audience gets bigger, as you cast a wider net, you catch weirder fucking fish. Yeah. And now you're having to to you know, there's a lot of people that drive by and take a shot at you, or you know, some of it's great, some of it's bad. Like the the internet's a highly negative place. Yeah. And if you talk to a lot of people that have bigger audiences. You have to kind of learn how to manage that, and it, it psychologically too. Because yeah. I mean, I remember early on in my career, a comment on the internet would ruin my dinner. Well, you know, the, it would stra- fuck my head it's up. It's strange you say that because um, yeah, I posted yesterday about I posted that video of of the of where the just come back mantra came from. And I, I don't look, I don't, I don't look it through the uh, messages, but you know, if they come up when you when yeah. you go onto the social media, you'll see the ones that have just been posted, and and there's one comment. From one stranger, and it and it said something, and I was just like, and it, again, it put me in a really bad mood. And you just you take out your head, you think about, you forget about all those hundreds and hundreds of positive comments, thousands of po- yeah. positive comments, and there's a one, one, one little comment from a nobody who's who's sitting in his basement hating himself I who think, says something. I, I think that's an evolutionary and, effect. And like, though. I think it's an evolutionary effect of how our brain works because. It's probably a survival instinct kind of thing. If you're walking through the woods, you know, as a caveman and the the pretty flowers and the beautiful scenery and the birds chirping, like, you notice all that. But, like, it's that one saber-toothed tiger (laughs) that that you really focus on, right? Because that's the one that could cause. And and so I I think think that that, that it's an evolutionary effect to some degree of why we can focus on, like, the one negative comment and somehow – ignore yep. the thousands yeah but you, but at, at there's a, you will get used to it to the point to where it will no longer bother you and i think coming from a background like yours to where you were kind of in a clandestine job you probably didn't interact with the public very much you didn't put yourself out there for clowns to talk about you know from and then up to 2019 mm-hmm. whenever you know so between now and in in this time i, I just think that there's a bit of an adjustment to where you where you go through like the own personal evolution of where things that used to bother you no longer yeah. will because you actually get a sense that that is in no way reflective of reality. If when, if you were Every, to go, everything's evolution. It's like even in a few years' time, I'll be thinking, "Oh, I can't believe I said that on on a podcast." Or on a <laughs> yeah, or no. I should have known. I'm like, it, it, I, I I recently had a, a chance to have like a really introspective experience, and uh, anyways. Uh, I, I was able to kind of get past a lot of the same stuff with me thinking about things because when you put it into context of time, you know, it, it no longer, you, you won't think about it that way any, yeah. anymore. So, but so, no, you're going to be shooting staccato pistols and you're going to be shooting a son's rifle. Yeah. And you've pretty much spec'd this thing out exactly how yeah. you want. Mm-hmm. Again, I don't think it'll be my last one. And it's just. Again, it's it, it's this thing of what what I'm gonna run right now isn't the be end and end all of it's like it's it's 
it's like how we should always do things. It's like I've won from a, a 13.7 inch barrel. Mm -hmm. That's my limited, in my limited knowledge on ballistics, it was this sweet spot of um, trying to get as much ballistic efficiency, but still have it short enough to do, in my opinion, short enough to do CQB. Um, and, then you, and then again, I know you can do CQB with any weapon or whatever, but it's these things. So it's just it's just feeling it, and and the, and the next the next uh, uh, build I do for for me or whatever could be a, a shorter one, yeah. and, and or it could be longer. It's unlikely it'll be longer, but it'll be, it be could be well, shorter. When we talked about the mechanics of the gun, I you know, from the armorer side is the the gun maker side, not the most. I don't know. I'm not the shooter. You're the shooter. You know, you're the race car driver. I build the engine. But that thirteen seven, uh, it's an extremely shootable gun. Like it is, it is the shortest barrel we can use a mid gas system on that has enough dwell to be super reliable, but short enough dwell to make it where it's very soft shooting. Mm -hmm. It's a very flat tracking gun. But, and that's what again caught, it caught me off guard. And it's a thing of where law enforcement. I speak to a lot of, uh, but most of the military, you you shoot even in special units. You shoot what you're given. And then you retire and you and you see what's out there if you're not from the United States and you and you see and you say, there's so much good, good stuff out there that we you know and it's a an all personal preference but it's so it's so good and that when I was firing when I was test firing the that thirteen point seven of mine, again I was like shooting thinking this is like. <laughs> This is cheat, cheating, it's like, but it's good. Yeah, it's, I, I really liked it. Okay. So, so coming from the UK, where there's virtually, I mean, gun ownership there is virtually non-existent, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, are there, is there gun ownership there? Yeah, I mean, the shotguns. Uh, um, you can own it in your home. Rifles, yeah, yeah. Um, I I don't have a UK firearms no, license. No, no. I'm, I'm not saying, but like uh, someone, if you if you live in London, can you own a shotgun in your home? So, as far as I'm aware, I've never had a firearms license, but you have to have a practical use for it. So if you if you have a gun you have to use it regularly and they check on that so it's not a case of you get your fire license right i'm going to have a shotgun and keep it in my in my home in a, in a safe that's not good enough you've got to either be part of like a ski club or some shooting club and go there regularly and they check how often you go there or you've got to be at, like do some game shooting and again it's checked that you do that and you've got to do it regularly um, and that's why i've never i've never pursued one although i would like to have one but because I'm not in the UK anymore now, right? Um, and 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 I'm pretty much well. I am a UK US taxpayer. Um, um, the um, yeah, I wouldn't be able to keep it. So even if I got a, a firearms license, you know, I'm not there enough to to, to keep it. Well, it's quite, and it's that, quite and the that, leap from UK to Texas. So that's, good, good that's, for you. That's that's to my knowledge. I could be incorrect there, but that's how I, I believe it is. But the but here's the thing is. Uh, I find it. I can't remember when. So at one point, not that in my lifetime, you could own an automatic pistol in the UK legally, and 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 other and rifles and things. And then there were some shootings in you, and there's a real tragic like school shooting in UK, which was the driver. But then they then they banned them all. They banned all the guns. And again, it's that. Do you remember when that was? Um, I'm not sure. It would have been. I think it might, I don't know, it might be around 2000, early, the early noughties. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see the noughties. No. <laughs> the noughties <laughs> are the 2000s. Not, ah, yeah, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the early noughties. Okay. Ah, okay. Let's, I gotcha. let's bring it into Texas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but it was, yeah, I'm, I think it might have been, I can't remember when it was, but it, and, but, but you could own it on all, and, and here's, the, here's the thing. Again, anyone who wants to throw any shit, go fuck yourselves. Is um, I was I was in the army when you could own a automatic pistol, but I did not know that. So what's that tell you? They, yeah, they, they kept it as like this niche, secret, exclusive sort of club, in my opinion. And people will be going, "No, that's not." True. Well, I didn't know about it, and I was I, I was a real geek about guns and things, and no one told me. Hey, by the way, if you do a firearms license, you could own a ten millimeter pistol and shoot that at weekends on a range. No one told me that. And I didn't know that, so that shows you how, how niche it was. Just, and yeah. it's a typical British thing to do, is you know instead of and and but here's where I bit them on the arse because when the time come to ban all firearms, no one had any, so it's easy to do because it was <laughs> because it's an it's an exclusive club and not many people then protest and go, hey, well, um, I've got guns and they're not and again in the wrong hands they're always going to be dangerous. But and and then that's that, so it was it was gone, 
so they were gone and um and they'll never come back and 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 I would never and again someone took me out of context when I said to Evan Hafer that gun law was like it would never work being bringing guns back to the UK because no one's going to stand up and say I think we should have guns back in the UK and again it it, it wouldn't work um but it's a good but taking a negative sorry a positive from a negative is it's a good lesson to everyone in the United States of just remember any rights that you give away you're never going to get them you're back you're never going to get them back that's the truth do you uh, you follow american politics quite a bit um i, I suppose more than more than most more than most but, huh? yeah so you you had an interesting encounter uh, yeah you you met one of our uh, famous american politicians yeah yeah i am <laughs> Is that something you're comfortable talking? About? Yeah, absolutely. I would talk. It's a good. It's, I've got two stories. There's yeah. not, not just one. There's so I, I met the um, 40, 45th president of the United States of America, Donald J. Trump. You met Don, you met Trump. Yeah. How did that happen? So, um, I'm gonna try and put. I'm putting this in order in my head. <laughs> so I'm. It's late 2019. Um, and I'm giving a presentation about the incident in Kenya to a, a U.S. military unit. And um, leading up to it, I talked to friends and think I was talking to friends. And long story short, is members of the Secret Service wanted to the Secret Service wanted to learn the lessons I learned from that day. So they reached out to me through official channels and said, "Hey, can you, can you want to come into our training establishment and just talk to some of our team leaders?" At a, on a personal level about what happened and you know what did you do and what would you recommend because we've been to that hotel and things I saw so it was more of a personal thing with the Secret Service to to, to talk to them about about uh, like what I'd learned so I was like yeah that's too easy um, so I was in DC and then um, leading again not long about a week leading into it they asked me they said oh have you, have you ever been to the White House I was like no and I said well bring a suit because after you talk to our guys will take you into the White House and give you a little tour just to show you around. And, and then again, tourists and things can go into the White House. So it's like, fine. Um, day, so. <laughs> the, day, the, the day comes, so I do, do, do a chat to the, some, the Secret Service guys and then we're going to the White House. Uh, earlier that day, uh, like um, the um, White House um, photographer, Sheila Craighead, she was... Um, who has her fingers and all the pies there and is the mover and shaker. She spoke to various people in the White House and said, hey, do you know, there's this guy called um, Chris Craighead, although Chris Craighead didn't exist then, but Chris yeah. um, is coming to the White House and you, just so you know. So they then spoke to their, their people and word spread. And when we were going into the White House, I didn't have my phone. The Secret Service got a call and said, oh, the, the vice president. Uh, Mike Pence would like to would like to meet with Chris and have a chat with him. Oh wow! So I was like, "Hey, you're gonna meet the vice president." So we went in the White House, saw the vice president. And this was unexpected. Yeah, you, completely. You were just going completely for a yeah, tour. I was going for a tour. I did not yeah. know this. Um, um, met the vice president, had a had a chat with him, then went on carrying, looking around the um, around the White House and the and the buildings nearby. Secret Service phone goes off again, and they're saying, "Hey, the um, the National Security Advisor, Robert O'Brien, Ambassador O'Brien, would like to have a word." So we go, oh, "We got to go and see him." So if this is going, this is like big, big things. So I then talked to Robert O'Brien, Ambassador O'Brien, real great guy, super knowledgeable. Again, tuned into everything. We talked about um, world, um, you know, world world affairs and things. And, bits and pieces and, and things about what I was I, I learned in Kenya. Really good chat, and we were talking for a while. All of a sudden, he then said, have, uh, have you have you uh, spoken to Portis yet? And I'm like, no. And he's like, oh, I know he wants to, I know he wants to speak to you. Come on, let's go. <laughs> so we, it's, this is a whirlwind. I'm not really doing it much justice. And then get, so I'd walk out of the office, the secret service, like, Chris, it's this way. And uh, the NSA is like, no. He's coming with us. We're going to see Portis, and they're like, "Oh!" <laughs> <laughs> so we then charge through, and it's moving like fast moving through. I'm just walking behind. Then get into this, go past the uh, uh, um, like a secretary PA, go into this room, and the sister say, "Hey, Chris, just wait here for a moment." He's in the in the in the private study. 
So I've got one of the um, <laughs> the strange, probably, honour of being one of the only people who've been in the Oval Office and didn't know he was in the Oval Office. <laughs> so I was in the Oval Office by myself, looking around, and and uh, you didn't you didn't recognise the Oval Office? No, I know it's smaller than what I thought. <laughs> and then um, so they, they're in the private study, I can hear them talking, and then there's a bit of laughing things, and, uh, and and the vice president's in there as well, and, and some aides and other people. And then they shout, hey, Chris, come on in. And then I walk in, and, and there's um, President Trump. No, like, there. And he, and he was familiar with you. I mean, he knew... It. He, he, I believe so, but the, the, this is what happens. So I walk in, and he looks, and he just bounds straight over, hand out, shakes my hand, and says, first things out of his mouth is, thank you for saving American lives. And, and, I was, and then we had a bit of a chat about other things. How many Americans were in there? I'm 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 not sure at all numbers from, were, from the from the from the from the get go. Um, there were two who, when it, as it moved on, two hadn't been evacuated, and then one of them has become a dear friend of mine. Really? Um, yeah. So, and, um, and that was his, that was his statement. Thank you for saving America. The first life. thing out of his mouth. Yeah. Wow. So um so without again I'm going to like caveat this with saying this is not like a political push or any, anything like that, but what you it's what I say about, you know, I, it's, you could say it's not my position to talk about U.S. politics. But from, the, from a personal point of view, and people say, oh, Trump's a bad man and, and that kind of thing. Well, there was no media there. There was no one there but his people. The British government didn't know I was going there. I didn't know I was going there. There was no agenda. So for that to be what he said to me, me meant to me, meant like... Kind of, kind, level of, kind of meant it. Well, a level and, of sincerity. Yeah, and, and, rather than, yeah. you know, not how, how do you do, what do you do? It wasn't like, a plan. It wasn't hey, a make photo sure op. You, make sure you catch this or whatever. It was, hey, thanks for saving American lives. No, that's... And then... That sounds like something a president should say. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, so that, and that was fine. And, um, and then, yeah, it was a bit surreal. And, and then we went on our way. And then, um... I, I didn't. The next day, I was telling, and I I gave him like a. I had a, a squad, my squadron um, coin. Mm -hmm. I gave him a squadron coin, and I, I got a Trump coin, or a President Trump coin, <laughs> and which is big and gold. And <laughs> <laughs> it's like I can imagine what Trump's coin looks big, like. Big, gold, and beautiful. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, and the next day, I was like messaging people. Oh, I met the president, and then one person said, "Oh, have you told the commanding officer?" And I was like, "No." And I was like, why? And in my mind, it's still not, not a big deal. It's like, oh, yeah, I went and met the president, but it's not like a thing. Yeah. Uh, again, maybe kind of, again, my, my, how, it, how I think, I was like just a, another man. I was just someone I met at that time. You know, I'm still probably buzzing off it. And then when you, you suppose you better, and I told the, basically told the establishment then, and they did not like that one little bit. Really? Yeah. Yeah, but you casually, kind of on accident, met the guy. Yeah, I mean, you it's didn't like, go yeah. there for. There was all sorts of then people, and people still apparently talk about it today in the Foreign Office about how that should never have happened. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Tell yeah, him refuse that. Like, yeah. yeah, well, you're in his house. Yeah, <laughs> you're a guest in his and, house. Like, oh no, I'm um, not going to meet with you. And it's like a big breach of protocol. I can see how it can upset people and and do things, but it's just how it happened. I had no saying it. I didn't. I didn't manufacture it. I didn't. I didn't make it happen. It was just. It happened. And uh, and yet one of the uh, uh, again I've I'll say because he's no longer in the regiment and and he was an officer and it's not really representative of the regiment but it was what he said it was like I was a, what was it I I'd undermined undermined the regiment the army the government and the country by meeting with President Trump so it just shows you how some people of the establishment viewed him the commander the commander in chief of yeah. uh, of and, an allied yeah. country so it's like they, so it's amazing that people think that's a bad thing. So I met with the president. He thought I'd done a really good thing. Shook my hand, and people were going, "That's disgusting. Should never have done that." Did you did, have you met? Had you ever met the like the prime minister no. of the? No. no, 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 no. He never think. He never shook your hand. No. Um, uh, yeah. So that's that. And then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, but then it doesn't stop there. So anyway, that goes on. And so it's about, that's in November 2019. In December 2019, 19, five five years ago. No. Four years ago, sorry. And um, um, I'm in London. I'd, I wasn't living in Kenya anymore. I'm in London. I'm doing some shopping. The phone rings, and because of how it says on my phone, I thought it might be in work. So I answered the phone. I'm like, yeah. 
And uh, there's a lady on the line going, oh, I'm blah, blah, I'm the special advisor to the US ambassador to the United Kingdom, Ambassador Johnson. He's on the line waiting to talk to you. Could you take the call? So I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so the US ambassador now called me and he's like, hey, hey, Chris, it's Woody here. Um, I've just been on the phone with Portis and he said he's, you're, you're a good guy and I know you're in London now, so do you want to, uh, do you want to swing by for a cup of coffee? <laughs> and uh, I'm like, yes, sir, I'll, I'll come around right now. So it was like being in a movie. I then hailed a taxi and went, take me to the U.S. Embassy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we went to the U.S. Embassy and um, st someone met me at the gate straight up, straight to the um, ambassador's office. And, and then he's like, how long meetings? And has, gives me a cup of coffee and we'll have a bit of a chat. And it's really good. It's really fun, fun to talk to him. And then this is where it gets a bit um, uh, different. He said, hey, um, I've got something to ask you. I've, um, I normally have drinks at my house uh, on this, this time of year, and it's tonight. I'd love you to come, come along. And I'm like, okay, Ambassador goes, I am dressed. I'm just in London for, for today, so I've got a... And I was, wearing, <laughs> I was wearing jeans. I had like a turtleneck sweater on <laughs> and a pea coat, so I looked like... Like an assassin or something from the movie, <laughs> and they're like a hitman, and then um, and he's like, so he's like, can you come round and 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 I said, I said I'm dressed like this, and he's like, yeah, don't worry, it's my party, everyone will be in suits, but it's fine. And he goes, and there's something else, and he's like, oh. he goes, usually the um, I said the U.S. representative me says something, gives a speech, and usually someone from the United Kingdom on behalf of the country gives a speech. I think you should do it this time. <laughs> and he goes, so work with my assistant and do a three to five minute presentation of what you did, why you did it, and what the special relationship means to you. And I said, well, I said, sir, just so you know that, like, I got into a bit of hot water for meeting the president without permission. I'm going to have to, like, call this in. And he's like, yeah, do it. Whatever permissions, whatever things we need to do, our uh, special assistant will help you. Fine. So then call the um, unit. Long story short, speak to the commander. So I say that you, you would need permission from the commander. To do I just that. wanted again after, after if the Trump thing hadn't happened, I wouldn't have bothered. Yeah. But because it was a going again protocol and things, so I said, "Hey, command to the colonel. Hey, colonel, just so you know, this is asked. What do you?" Th and he goes, "Just do it." Um. <laughs> so it's like, do go and go and um, do this. Go go and go and who does wins? Right, fine. So then I um. So then I'm like looking at the guest list and there's like lots of the high ranking British politicians are there. The prime minister was supposed to be there, but he didn't turn up. Um, but the, le the and the head of the army, head of the Navy, head of the Air Force are all there. So I'm like, pressure's on. I should add as well, this is about half past four in the afternoon. This speech is gonna happen in two hours at half past six. So I haven't got much time to prepare it. And I've got to pick my shopping up from central London. So I'm and anyway, get to the embassy sorry not to embassy to the residents and um people start coming in i'm going through my mind and he said oh just stand next to me and his, uh, his beautiful wife and um and people walking in people must look at me and think i must be he's like heavy i must be the guy like you know, when, <laughs> when you see the ambassador and and there's and there's uh, plastic on the floor like in lethal weapon 2 and he's in the room yeah you're not coming out <laughs> that's what they must have thought and um but they're um coming in and then he and then he starts his presentation did someone help you write this? I mean, was there no, someone there to no, kind of no, 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 just, just and, and wing I did, it? I just did it in my head. It was like, and um, so then, so was, he, it, was, he, it, was it was it any good? He's doing his presentation. <laughs> it was fucking brilliant. Well, yeah, if you're an ambassador, <laughs> like, you're, you're yeah, probably a decent yeah, public speaker. Yeah, he's good. Uh, no, he's good. He's he's entertaining, and that's worse because you, you you know you're following. Yeah, if I'm, I was following Ambassador Johnson, so I'm like. You, yeah, you can't. You cannot suck, and um, so he's doing it, doing this thing all the time. He's speaking. I'm like in my mind. I'm going through it. my 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 presentation is changing every second. It's like it's like the matrix going on in there. Yeah. And, and and um and then he and then he gives gives us the uh, mic. And I didn't know it was going to be like again when I see the mic. I'm like oh, this I thought it was going to be. And he and I'm like oh yeah. And uh, and then I start I start talking, and. There might be people who they they won't be listening to this, but <laughs> Don't but they probably if it's ended in the papers or whatever. Um, the uh, but it was good. 
I, I, you know when you when you know you're doing well, you, yeah, you, yeah. you know on a roll. I'm going. This this is going well. I'm looking at reactions and it's talking. It's very very on point, very short, and um, and at the end I finish and I was supposed to say just do like raise a glass or whatever and have a, a drink. And it was good because when I stopped, and I'm trying to get my drink to get, I'm fumbling around with this mic trying to get the drink. Everyone starts cheering and applauding. Pro- applauding. So they're all clapping and applauding. I'm like, oh, I need to do this, like, toast or whatever. I need to, like, raise a drink. And then all of a sudden, like, again, something took over in my head. N- went from the, o- uh, the normal to the abnormal. So then I, like, take control of the situation, if you like, and then right. completely do something I wasn't thinking about. Put the mic down, and everyone's cheering and clapping. I then sh- shout. I've got a loud voice when I want it. And I went, ladies and gentlemen. And everyone's just like... Stop, there's like 100 to 200 people here. They all like, look, and I'm like, raise my, God save the queen and God bless America. And then take. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And then Ambassador Johnson then came up and was like, that, that's fucking brilliant. <laughs> Afterwards, so it's like, yeah, it was good. It was, I didn't plan on saying that, but all of a sudden it just came out. And, but you, they, obviously your commander gave you permission to go ahead and do it. He gave me, yeah, but again, that then went bad. When, when afterwards there was a lot of people I didn't hear it officially but my friends who worked in headquarters were saying yeah people were like going who does he think he is and like Man. one of my friends was saying well what do you think he did just like went in and demanded to do it um, so again it's another thing and that was like I think that was the final straw with the establishment and uh, and things started going like I knew I wouldn't have a career after that and, I, and I'd done 28 years and I was and there was a lo- load of other factors, um, none of which was some of the newspapers reported that I was shunned by my colleagues. I've never been shunned by my colleagues. But so there's other factors, and that was the following year when I decided to retire. Now, you were presented a, a very high honor. Yeah. yeah. What, 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 I was awarded a, 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 a conspicuous gallantry cross. A conspicuous gallantry cross. Yeah. But, yeah. And the, what is the, the equivalent in the U.S.? It's hard, the, again, the, the, it's hard to do direct equivalent. It would have been like, is it the Distinguished Service Cross uh, or Navy Cross and okay. things like that? So, um, and was this, pres- this how, and how, how was this presented to you? You know this, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I went into an office in London and someone, some civil servant just gave it to me in a box. So that was, that was the ceremony for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I could have. I, I. It was my decision to not have the investiture, but. But there's. It's not. It's not black and white. Where I decided not to have it, and then because, when I said I, I don't. I don't really want to have it. They could have said, "Oh, by the way, it's going to be in three weeks' time." Yeah. And then they knew it was, but they. They didn't. The, the bottom line is they didn't want me to get it, like that. Again, it's this whole uh, establishment bitterness, jealousy, combined with lots of other things. That they don't, they don't. Like the bottom line is, and and anyone who thinks otherwise, again, I don't know why I'm bothered about what other people think, but go fuck yourselves. Mm-hmm. Is that yes. they do not, they do not like what I did that day. When I say they, the establishment, whatever that means, whoever falls into that, but they do not like what I did that day. Bottom line. Yeah, I think it's because you were like the glitch in the in the matrix. You were like the, you but, know, there was you, you broke from the from the order you know yeah so but i'm but i should add as well that i'm as i've said a lot a few times i'm super grateful and thankful that i was there and i was able to help i think a lot of people are i think a lot of people are grateful that you were there like maybe there's people you saved every day i give thanks that i was there and yeah able to help so you have been now you and i have talked and we've had private conversations and i've heard your I've heard the story from your mouth, and I, I will tell you, when I hear you tell the story of what happened, like, like the hair on my neck stands up. It's a, it, it's a, it's a pretty powerful and compelling stuff. Not just like in an action scene kind of thing, but more just in the, almost a, the spirituality of of the incident, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to push you on that kind of stuff right now. But do you have a plan to? tell that story at some point is there a, a venue in which you would like to tell your actual experience i've heard it i'm privileged to have heard it i know that it's something that you're not completely prepared to, to discuss but what is your plan to tell that story because i gotta tell you it's a compelling <clears throat> and moving story um well i did write a book about it 
and the book was just about um, just so we're clear it wasn't about um, anything else other than well it was about that story and my early life uh, leading up to it nothing to do with my career in the SES but that got blocked by the government I did a legal challenge on that and that got it was a hit job um, it was a hit job and I didn't I wasn't successful I'm going was to the want, book completed? yeah Books completed. Yeah, uh, but it was, it was it was it was stopped by the MOD. They said it was breaking secrets, and they couldn't and have it, redacted. I, the I, and they were not interested in that. And when I say secrets, like I'll give an example of three oh. of the secrets, not without saying what the secrets are. Um, when so when it reads like, "Oh, we stopped them from writing this book because, or we stopped them from publishing because they gave away too many secrets." Like, if you want, if you think that what was in my med kit is a secret, or how many rounds in my pistol magazine holds. Um, that's the kind of example. So, um, so the how many um, how many rounds are in your Glock nineteen? Ma- um, <laughs> and you like secret. so it's things like that. And it was it was I, like I yeah again it's a bit of a fuck you, but um, you know we did launch the appeal and the judge didn't apply any critical thinking in my opinion whatsoever to the MOD's argument because she had a high ranking officer. So why wouldn't she believe them if you've got a general and other highly I wouldn't say experienced but people have served a long time and there's a difference. Um, uh, officers saying, yeah, this is going to cause this, this, and this, or it's going to cause bad relations. And just, I don't think any critical thinking was applied and just went, yeah, fair enough. Why would I not believe you? And uh, so the book's not coming. Well, I've launched an appeal which is likely to be unsexful. Un- 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 unsuccessful. <laughs> unsuccessful uh, and unsexful as well. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and the um, um, so so that's that. Um, so as of right now, the book that is already completed, but, it is it is it will not see the light of day as of right now. As of right now, no. And um, you know what? People change, policies change, attitudes change. It may it may come out, you know. And um, um, but but right now it's not. Um, so well, who knows? And th- but this is the problem with. They're happy for anyone else, anyone else, even other members of my old unit to tell the story because it's not as if it's an unknown thing that people write books about operations. It happens all the time. They're doing it all the time. They just don't want my... Op- I, again, it all goes back to they didn't like what I did that day. And um, um, but, th- but lots of people are interested in it. So I'm not going to... like For right now, I'm not telling the story. And th- that's the frustrating thing is that people... Uh, on YouTube, there's tons and tons of videos about what people think happened that day there may of the be there may in the future books come out about what ha- what people think happened that day there may even be movies come out what people think happened that day because everyone else is allowed to tell the story just not me and and that's one of the and to add to the frustration is that everything that's out there and everything that's on youtube and everything that is incorrect and when i say incorrect is that the real the true story that that i know is is much better and much more badass than what people think really happened. No, whenever you and I sat and talked that day, I, I um, whatever it was I thought had happened, but hearing like the before, the you know some of this stuff you had shared. Uh, Are we talking about meeting an angel. Yes, I, I can talk about that. You can talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So it's 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 like a strange thing that. Like I was in, um, so on that morning I was doing my own bit training outside of town and doing stuff and uh, um, and I was driving, driving. I mean, I'm really abbreviating this and simplifying it, but I was driving, driving home uh, along this road, which you didn't really see many people on the on this road. So I was stopped as I just pulled onto it. I'm like shocked to see some guy walking down the road, some short um, African guy in an immaculate suit. With highly polished shoes, walking down the road, so I like. But something came over me to break all procedures, everything that would common. Like when I say procedures, not anything sensitive, just common sense thing. No. And I stopped the car, opened the window, and said, "Hey, do you want to lift?" Something compelled me to do that. So this guy shuffles over to the car, gets in. He's like, "Thank you so much." Let's. So then driving down the road. And he's chatting, and then he says, oh, what, what's your name? I'm like, it's Chris. And he tells me his name, and it's like, how old are you? And at the time, I'm 
So I'm 43. He goes, I'm 43. When were you born? It's like September. He goes, I was born in September. What day? I tell him the day. He goes, I don't know what day in September was born, but this is a good sign. That means in September 1975, Chris, Chris and I were born. And uh, he chuckles to himself, drive down. He said some other things I can't recall, but then what I do recall is then he reaches into his pocket and starts pulling out this like, like long dagger. And uh, my spider senses aren't like flashing red or whatever. I, I don't feel chill about this. He pulls out this like long dagger and uh, it's odd, odd and it's got a double thing I remember, which is unusual. It had a double, a double point, double tipped. And I just smile at him and say, you're not going to try and kill me with that, are you? And he's like, no, no, no. I, I carry this along the road in case I come across any demons or evil spirits. And then he chuckles to himself and puts it away. We then carry on driving, and uh, and I and I comment and say, "Well, judging on how you dressed, I take it you're going into the city." And he's like, "No, no, no! I'm just going to the first village you come to. Don't go inside the village. Just drop me off outside the village." I'm like, "Okay." And then I see a village coming into sight. Remember, this is in Africa, and I'm like, "This village." He's like, "Yeah, this is perfect." So as I come to a stop, he then opens the door and puts his foot on the floor and then something happens he puts his foot on the floor and his face changes it doesn't ch it's still the same person but it's a bit like if i insulted you and you like like pulled a face at me like what his face changed and he's like chris and then his voice changed and his voice to me i've described it before is it was quiet but loud and i felt it through my whole body it's like chris and I looked at him and he's like, may God bless you many times this day. And then his face changed and he's like smiling. Like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then got out the car and, and drove off. And I didn't really think that much of it. As I drove off, I looked and, you know, and then I couldn't see him. I don't know where he went, but I, I'm sure he's a real person. But I, I didn't think much of it that day. But then 30 hours later, after the most remarkable day of my life, even when I was inside the complex, when I was walking out back to my vehicle to drive home, I was thinking about what he said, and those words were echoing, may God bless you many times this day. Oh, wow. How long before, I mean, That's, when, when you left that man to the time you went in? Um, it would have been about four, four hours, four or five hours before. My gosh. And and everything after that was like millisecond perfect, like like everything. Because traditionally, I would always said I'm an unlucky person. So if they said, "Oh, this is going to happen on your watch," I would have went, oh, "I'm probably going to be on leave somewhere else. This is going to happen." But strangely, that day, everything, everything was perfect, perfect. And 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 again, uh, without going into too much detail about the internet itself, but every second counted, every second. And then from that moment on, everything was like, if you had to plan the day out perfectly, I, I went and got my hair cut after that. Had a haircut. <laughs> went and had something to eat. Had a cocktail with my with my uh, lunch, with some Moroccan beef. <laughs> and and then went home, had a shower. Then the phone, and then got got out, got dressed. Just just put, pulled a shirt on. Phone rang. That's it. Anything had happened left and right of that it would have been a different story and I wouldn't have got there because the whole city is closing down on that incident and I got there before anyone else. That's amazing. Well, not before anyone else, but I got there fast. Man. So, Chris, is there anything that... Uh, is there anything you want to say before we wrap up? Is there anything you want people to know? Mm. <laughs> I'm sure there's quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> if... Um, but, um, well, if you haven't already bought it, there's the children's book, The Wrong Wolf, is out now, available on Amazon and the, Barnes & Noble. The children's... A chil I wrote a children's book called the, the Wrong Wolf. The Wrong Wolf. Yeah. Um, which is about, in a, in a nutshell, it's about a wolf that gr grows up to be a sheepdog. And... Um, I'm gonna go buy this today. I'm like, I, I, I wasn't even aware that you had like. I know you pretty well. I did not know you had a children's book. Yeah, it's, it got published two weeks ago. Really? Don't you look at my social media? Clearly, you don't. 
I do. You well, you follow me, but don't follow me. You, I, <laughs> you look, but you don't see. No, no, no. That, that's <laughs> no, I'm only man messing. Yeah. It's, it's it's out. It's out. It's called the wrong wolf, and and the the whole underlying not underlying. Obviously, it says it on the back of the book, but it's the um, it's about a, the book is represents of doesn't matter how or where you're born. That doesn't define where you're going to end up in life. So, because as I've said on a on a TV interview, a very short TV interview about people killing themselves, was that you know life had set me up to fail, and how I was where I was born, how I was born, and my physical like presence, everything. Life was setting me up to be a failure, to fail in my, and and it took me from a council house in northeast England to the White House, and. Who 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 just saw that? No one saw that coming. I certainly didn't, and and here I am in Texas. Well, I gotta tell you, whenever we got first introduced through mutual friends, and there was an opportunity to for Sons Liberty to work with you, and having had a little bit of familiarity with your story, you know, obviously our theme is 1776. Yeah, <laughs> but but if there was anybody, uh, if there was any. Uh, Brit, we were going to work with, man. I mean, honestly, your your story is is one of rebellion, and it is one of of individualism and individual courage and uh, breaking with the order of things. And there's there's certainly a chemistry here. I think that it makes a lot of sense for us to do some cool stuff together. Yeah, yeah. and people said, um, do you know when I'm talking about 1776? <laughs> and then I remember one comment, and like I don't read them; it's just something I saw. And it said that oh, it's a good job you weren't around in 1776, <laughs> and uh, and I said oh, you weren't a right British soldier in 1776, <laughs> and I said well, you know, I do want to be an American, so I probably would have been a turncoat anyway, so it would have been all right. <laughs> hey, Chris, it's been Thanks awesome, very much, man. Mike. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming on, dude. Thanks for joining us today right here at the Liberty Tree Studio, but be sure to visit us at solgw.com for hard-use blasters, badass swag, and much, much more.